Good morning and welcome to Zion's ongoing online services. We begin with prayer. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are gathered together in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray by your Holy Spirit, open our hearts that we might be taught to repent of our sin, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then let us confess our sins to God in prayer and seek his forgiveness for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. But we are sorry for our transgressions and pray of your bountiful mercy. Be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Renew us by your spirit and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven. With boldness and confidence, we may approach the throne to find grace to help in every need. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Lord, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, and who by your word calls sinners into the kingdom of your Son, mercifully hear the prayers of your people. Give to us the peace of knowing that our sins find full forgiveness by you through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross, so that, so that in the trials and tribulations that afflict us in, the life, in this life because of sin, we might always look forward to that day when we will enter into the joy of our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is written in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9, where uh, through the prophet the Lord uh, speaks concerning the person of Christ Jesus and his work. He says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says the Lord, thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Our second scripture lesson is written in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. These verses... Uh, remind us that while we are living in this world as believers in Christ, we don't just have a perfect existence. Um, we can expect all kinds of trials and tribulations, but through them our Lord is working for us 
something far greater. You, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, as, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So far, our scripture lessons, we now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Mystery hidden in warmer ages, mystery 
mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. When God created man, he created us to have various aspects. Uh, we are physical beings. We are emotional beings. We are also spiritual beings. And that being the case, we have very specific needs, such as the need for food and drink. We have the need for relationships and love of various kinds. And we also have a need for God's word. And then when sin entered into the picture, we also have a need for his sacraments. Since we have these needs, we also have that which is necessary for us. To obtain food and drink, we have the necessity of working. Since we have a need for relationships and love, we have the necessity of being kind and considerate to one another. And since we have the need of of having God's word and his sacraments, we therefore also have the necessity of devotion and worship. So we can speak for ourselves of that which is necessary. But now think about God. Does he have any needs? Well, we can't say that because the Bible makes it abundantly clear that all things originate in God. And so there's no part of him that is in need of anything. Ironically, though, when it comes to that which is necessary, Holy Scripture does inform us that God's own nature, the fact that he is holy and merciful and gracious, that there are some things which are necessary for him. And that may be a strange thought at first, but it's the thought that our text relays to us today, and in doing so, it provides our faith in Jesus with a more solid foundation. The word of God that we're going to consider is Luke chapter 2, verses 40 through 52. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So far, the word of God. The babe of Bethlehem that we celebrated last week already in this text has now already grown up to the age of 12. He has survived Herod's murderous plot. He has survived living in Egypt after, until after Herod's death. And now he is living in the town of Nazareth. As he grew up over these years, he had 
the same needs and necessities that we all do. That's not a remarkable thing to say about a little boy. To him, to feed him, to give him a drink, to teach him some things. But when we remember that this little boy is the one of whom the angel said would be called the Holy Son of God, this is a rather remarkable thing. It reminds us that this Jesus isn't just a demigod, part God and part man, as all pagan religions invent concerning some supposedly great hero from their mythology. Instead, this child is fully man with all of our weaknesses except sin, and yet also fully God without any weakness whatsoever. He so completely entered into the sufferings we experience because of sin that he had to endure them all. Hunger pains, growing pains, toothaches, headaches, and so forth. It was necessary for him to experience such things so that he could be tempted in all points as we are and yet remain sinless for us and for our salvation. But then we read this familiar response of Jesus to his mother when they had been searching for him for three days and she begins mildly scolding him. He says, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? There are two things to notice here concerning Jesus' response. First of all, the Greek word for must, when he says, I must be in my father's house, it can literally be translated, translated it is necessary for me. And then secondly, the fact that Jesus was referring to his heavenly father and thus to that divine relationship that he has always had with the father in heaven, we see that it was necessary for him, even as God, to be doing something. And this should lead us to ask, why was it necessary? Does God have anything that is necessary? Well, it's an important statement. The only statement that we actually have recorded from the time Jesus was born to the time he was 30 years old and began his public ministry. It's important enough that the Holy Spirit thought this one statement out of everything else he spoke in his early years was important enough for us to know about which means it's important for us to know and to understand. So consider that for the people of that time, the phrase, my father's house, wasn't just about a location, but about an occupation. In a time when the majority of the people didn't have a place of employment as we do, their homes were their primary places of business. There were no Amazon warehouses or power plants for them to go to and punch a time clock. Sure, some of them hired themselves out to larger, more wealthy landowners, but mostly they were self-employed, like Joseph, who was a carpenter. And his home would have been the place of his business. So on this occasion, Jesus was in what was considered to be the house of the Lord or the house of his father. And so by remaining there that those three days and asking questions and giving answers, Jesus was being about his father's business. And he says, it is necessary for me to be about my father's business. Now that leads to the question, what is the father's business? It is the business of being a God of grace and truth, as we are told concerning Jesus in the first chapter of John. This is what was necessary also for Jesus, the Son of God, to be. But understand that this necessity 
isn't something that is laid upon him by some outside source, either for the Father or for the Son, as though someone else is dictating what they must be about. That would be blasphemy. It is necessary for them to be about grace and truth because it is their very divine nature that makes them God. The scripture tells us that God cannot lie. And it also informs us that God is love. And grace is nothing more than undeserved love. So by being about his father's business, Jesus wasn't in the temple those three days simply to show off his understanding he was speaking truth and grace to the teachers. And the result is that they were amazed at his understanding, which in all honesty wasn't an understanding that they had possessed, as we see revealed throughout Jesus' public ministry. They were often questioning him about the truth that he spoke, the grace that streamed forth from his lips. And that's because... There is this idea that is always prevalent in the world, and you'll hear it from time to time expressed, unfortunately, even by many Christian pastors and teachers, that God can do whatever he wants. That is a rather shallow notion, because God isn't driven by selfish, a selfish will so that one day he might be a benevolent father showering us with good things, only to change his mind the next day and torment us like a child standing over a grasshopper. That is how all the pagan religions imagine God to be. And the very idea is a large part of what makes those religions pagan or useless. Our God, the true God of heaven and the creator of the entire universe, is a God who does according to a will that is fixed by his own divine and gracious nature. Just as our will has been corrupted by sin and is therefore the reason we do things that are sinful, so God's will is righteous and holy. And it is the reason that he does what is righteous and holy at all times. It is necessary for him to be righteous and holy. For unless he is righteous and holy, he would not be God. To be righteous and holy is to be without sin. And if one were without sin, he would always do and say the loving thing. He would always speak truth and grace to his hearers. So ultimately, what the business of God is, what is necessary for him according to his own divine nature, is to give life. He's in the business of giving life because he is life, as the scriptures tell us. He is in the business of imparting truth because he is the truth, as Jesus said of himself. He is in the business of doing good because he is the very definition of good. And he is in the business of being gracious because he is the God who is eternal love. And all of this, when you put it together, means he is in the God, he is in the business of being about salvation for sin. So when Jesus says that he must be about his father's business, he's not speaking of some obligation placed upon him, but about the compelling force of his own divine nature. In other words, just as there are some things that God can't do because he is God's, like lie or sin or die, there are also some things that are necessary for him to do because he is God. If he didn't do those things, he would be acting contrary to his own nature, which he cannot do. Scripture tells us that he is faithful and cannot deny himself. This is, after all, the whole reason Jesus was born in the first place. He is God, and as God, he could not sit idly by while man 
whom he loved so deeply, doomed himself to eternal condemnation through sin. He couldn't deny his own nature and refuse to rescue us, which means he couldn't refuse to become one of us and live in obedience to his own law and then become the sacrifice for our sins and the sins for the whole, of the whole world. But we should take this one step further because it is this last step that really gives our Christian faith its deepest certainty, that solid foundation on which we can rest even when so much in our lives seem to be in turmoil and we're wondering what God is up to. What God can't do because he is God is what became necessary for God to do because he is God. God cannot sin, and yet it was necessary for him to become sin for us. God cannot lie. He cannot become, the, but he became the liar, just as he became the murderer and the adulterer and the covetous man when he bore our sins on his own body on the cross. God cannot die. And yet that is exactly what was necessary for him to do. Not just for our salvation, but because he is a God of love and grace and truth. All of this that God cannot do because he is God, he became in Christ. Because he is the God who is compelled by his own divine nature to save us from the sins that we have committed. It was necessary for him to be about the Father's business of rescuing us. This is the source of our confidence, of our faith's confidence. It doesn't reside within us, in our hearts. It comes from God doing what God is. Jesus did what God does because Jesus is God. His whole life on earth was about doing the business of saving us from sin, death, and hell. He took on a human nature, became obedient to the law of God, healed and preached the gospel and raised the dead. And then he gave that perfect life, full of grace and truth, as the ransom payment for the many sinners residing in the world. He thus also told those disciples on the day that he rose from the dead, those two disciples who were on the way to Emmaus, using the exact same phrase, it is necessary that the Christ suffer, die, and rise again. It was necessary for him because that's exactly what a holy, merciful, and abundantly gracious God would do. This gives us confidence because it assures us that the time will never come when our God and Savior will decide to do something other than what he has already told us he is all about in Holy Scripture. He won't at some point in the future decide not to give us eternal life. Our God is not the willy-nilly, ever-changing deity that all the pagan religions imagine him to be. No, our God gives eternal life to all those who trust in Christ because that is his business, to be the source of life. And so Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. Now many would imagine that a God who is confined by his own nature or who according to his own nature, acts out of necessity to somehow be less than that. On the contrary, it proves him to be more than we can possibly conceive. He is the God who must save, for it is in his very nature to do so. And in that, we can be confident. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall guard and keep our hearts and our minds 
through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Father in heaven, you have shown us eternal love and mercy by sending your Son to redeem us from sin, death, and hell. We thank and praise you for this greatest of gifts and for the promise that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We ask that you would give us ever greater gifts of spiritual insight so that we may comprehend your grace and truth toward us in your Son. Teach us to receive him into our hearts by faith so that believing in him as the only Savior who took our guilt and punishment upon himself, we may always be counted as your sons and daughters and heirs of life eternal. Bless your church throughout the world and equip all believers with power and zeal and a desire for your word. Strengthen us by dislodging the power and effect of sin in our lives and instead promote within us humility and true godliness. Keep us steadfast in your word so that rejoicing in our salvation, we may glorify your name and show forth your honor and praise. Extend your kingdom over all lands and nations so that all may acknowledge your son as Lord and only Savior. We also pray that you would give us true wisdom to all who are in any authority in the earth, from parents to national leaders. We ask that you would cause them to govern and, and exercise their authority in peace, justice, love, and mercy. In all our homes, give parents grace and wisdom to bring up their children in the fear of the Lord which is the beginning of all wisdom. Dear God, be near to all who face temptation and to all who are in peril of body or soul and grant to them a secure sense of your presence and grace in Christ. In these and in all other things of which we stand in need, give your help and mercy. We ask it in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.